Hi, this is Chris Peters for the Hampton History Museum, and today we're going to talk about the first Africans in Virginia and how they got here. Now, this is a fairly complicated uh, topic, but we're going to try to keep it simple. And we're going to start by talking about where these folks came from, which would be West Central Africa. Today it would be in the modern country of Angola, although 400 years ago you had a bunch of different political entities at play here, including the Portuguese Empire, several independent African kingdoms, and the Kingdom of Ndongo, which is the one that we're most interested in right now. Now Ndongo sits about 100 miles inland from the coast, and uh, Ndongo was a fairly advanced society in the 17th century. Uh, it was comprised of agricultural land dotted with suburban and urban centers. The capital of Ndongo, the city of Kabasa, had 30,000 people living in it. So these are not small villages. Some of these cities are quite large. And each city or smaller suburban zone would have been surrounded by agricultural land. Uh, most of the people who lived in Ndongo were involved in skilled trades of some kind. Often that meant textiles, but it could also mean iron working. So what I have in my hands here is an example of a West African axe, and uh, it's made out of iron and steel with a wooden handle. A little bit different from European axes because uh, the fuel to heat up the metal is a premium item in this part of the world, so they have to use as little metal as possible because they don't have the fuel to use a lot of iron. So African tools like this one would have been used for agriculture, would have been used for processing wood, uh, and this is just one example. They had lots of different tools. So they come from a fairly industrialized society where a lot of folks are involved in iron working or the... Um, or textile trades, and then during the fall, almost everybody living in Ndongo also helps bring in the harvest, which means most of these people have firsthand experience doing advanced types of agriculture. They're involved in the planting, they're involved in the harvesting. So that's a brief look at the kingdom of Ndongo and the people that were living there. During the beginning of the 17th century, this is one of the areas where the empire of Portugal was expanding its influence. And that started in the 1570s with the city of Luanda, which became a rest stop for Portuguese ships heading to Asia uh, to be involved in the spice trade. Portuguese ships have to sail all the way around Africa to get to India or China. It's a very long voyage, and they need places to stop and take on provisions. So that's why they set up Luanda in the first place. Well, by the 16 teens, about 30 years later, they're starting to expand their influence in the region, and that means they're coming into conflict with the neighboring kingdoms. Now, they'd allied themselves with the large and very stable kingdom of Congo to the north, and they were taking over the territories of the smaller kingdoms to their east, and that would include the kingdom of Ndongo. So in 1618 and 1619, the Portuguese, along with their native uh, allies, a group called the Mbangala, were attacking the kingdom of Ndongo. And they were enslaving large numbers of people that were being captured during this conflict. Now, many of these enslaved people were being sold to the Kingdom of Congo, which was heavily involved in the intercontinental trade of, uh, of enslaved Africans across Africa itself. And then many of them were also being brought down to the city of Luanda, where they were loaded onto Spanish or Portuguese slave ships to be carried to the New World. So the image that you can see at the back of our exhibit here shows how these folks would have been walked from the kingdom of Ndongo down to the coast. They would have been uh, connected to each other either with wooden yokes, which is depicted in the image here, or with chains and iron collars that went around their necks. One way or another, they were connected to each other and restrained so that they could be controlled as they were marched down to the sea. Now, once they reached the port of Luanda, they would have been loaded onto ships. And while they were on board those ships, they had to be restrained. So in the exhibit, we also have an original set of 17th century slave shackles of the kind that would have been used on one of these Portuguese or Spanish ships. And I also have a reproduction of these shackles so I can describe how they would have been used. Now, as you can see, it's too large to restrain somebody's hands. In most cases, 
once they were loaded into the ship, these people would have been sat down inside the cargo hold or they would have been laid down on the deck and then they would have had their feet bound with these. Now there's two shackles on each set so it could restrain one person or more likely their captors would put one person's right foot into the first shackle and the next person's left foot into the second one and then an iron ring gets put through the end of this and hammered flat so that they can't come off again. Now you've got two people connected together. It's gonna to be really difficult for them to move around and mount any kind of resistance to their enslavers. Now, down inside that ship, which is not actually a slave ship, we predate the organized system of slave ships that carried people across and that was their only purpose. This would have been a retrofitted cargo ship. So. Many of these ships were coming from Spain or Portugal down to colonial Africa to drop off supplies like weapons and armor and trade goods, and then they would load up their cargo hold with their enslaved prisoners to be brought to the New World. So in the spring of 1619, a Spanish ship called the San Juan Bautista, which was a fairly large one, arrived in Luanda, offloaded its cargo, and then took on about 350 of these Ndongan prisoners who are going to be shipped to the uh, Spanish colony of Mexico, or New Spain. And specifically, they're headed to the port of Veracruz, which is where most of the enslaved Africans being brought to uh, the Spanish New World would have disembarked. So if you look at the, the red line across our map here, this represents the voyage that they would have taken from Luanda to Mexico. That red line shows nearly 5,000 miles of transatlantic sailing. This is a much longer voyage than most of the uh, voyages coming from Europe to the Americas. Uh, most ships coming from Europe would be at sea for two to three months. The San Juan Bautista would have been at sea for almost five before it reached the coast of Mexico. Now, when we get to the Western Caribbean, the San Juan Bautista was very close to its destination, only a couple hundred miles from Veracruz, when they encountered English privateers. And this was a pretty normal occurrence in the Caribbean during the summer. Every year, English privateers uh, and privateers from other countries would come to the Caribbean and they would hunt Spanish treasure galleons. These ships would have been uh, leaving from Mexico during the summer, they would have gathered together in Havana, Cuba, and then all of them would have sailed together as a fleet back to Spain. Well, you can't attack that fleet because there's too many ships, but if you can capture one of the individual ships on its way to Havana, you can make a fortune. This gold would have been the wealth of the Inca, the Aztec, and the Maya societies of Central America that the Spanish were taking during the conquest of this territory and shipping back to Spain. So if you can capture one of these ships, you can make a lot of money off of it. Now, these ships have also just left port when the English privateers encounter them, which means they are full of food and water as well. And after crossing the Atlantic Ocean, these English ships aren't going to have enough provisions to sail back home, so they have to take on fresh supplies. Well, in the summer of 1619, off the coast of Mexico, two English privateers encountered the San Juan Bautista, believing it was a Spanish treasure galleon. They captured the ship, and instead of finding gold and silver, they found a bunch of half-starved Ndongans down inside on their way to Mexico. The ship has been at sea longer than the English privateers. It doesn't have enough food and water. So the English are going to do the only thing they can think of. They take about 60 of the Ndongans off of the ship, and they're going to sail for the nearest English port where they can trade those people to get fresh supplies to complete their voyage back to England. Now, the nearest English port in this case is going to be Virginia. So after attacking the San Juan Bautista, these two English privateers are going to turn north, and they're going to spend a couple of weeks sailing up the coast of North America to get to the Chesapeake Bay. They arrived sometime around the end of August in 1619, and the timing was perfect because just the year before, the Virginia Company of London had started handing out tracts of land in large quantities to English colonists, and most of those colonists were trying to grow tobacco. It was the major cash crop coming out of this region, and it was the purpose behind most of the English uh, immigration to Virginia at the time. 
So when the Ndongans arrived here, they're stepping into a place where the English colonists of Virginia, who are mostly poor folks from uh, the streets of London or other English cities, they really don't have any experience dealing with agriculture. These are mostly unskilled laborers. And England's a fairly cold country, so they're not accustomed to working in the heat of Virginia. Well, the Ndongans come from a region that is admittedly more arid than Virginia. It's a lot drier, but it's still hot, and they're accustomed to working in, in, in advanced agricultural settings. So we're going to replace that African-style axe with a European one now. They're familiar with this type of tool. They know how it works. They know how to use it. It's made out of the same materials as their tools at home. They're simply replacing what they've been doing at home with what they're gonna do in Virginia. So these folks are more robust. They can survive in the climate of Virginia. They have skills that are useful here. And one of the most important points for the landholders of Virginia, there are no contracts protecting the labor of these Ndongans. So we don't know exactly how this was organized when the Ndongans arrived here, but they certainly weren't indentured servants like the English that were coming here at the same time. So the arrival of these Ndongans is going to set the stage for the development of chattel slavery in the Americas, or at least in British North America, uh, in a way that it had not existed before. Now, can we say 1619 marks the beginning of African slavery in Virginia? There's a lot of debate about that topic. It depends on who you talk to, but we can say that these people were treated as property when they arrived here, and we can say that this laid the foundation for the development of uh, slavery in the colonies afterwards. So those are two things that we can say with absolute certainty. So when they arrive in Virginia, their main purpose is going to be working on tobacco plantations, growing tobacco, and this is actual tobacco here, uh, which has been dried and is ready to be shipped. Uh, it's laying on top of a barrel. All of this tobacco being grown in Virginia would have been cut, it would have been dried, it would have been packaged into large barrels called hogsheads, and then it would have been loaded in ships to be carried back to England. Once it arrived there, it would be sold on the European market where it would fetch a huge sum of money as a luxury item. This was the main objective of most companies in Europe at the time. They wanted to import luxury goods from around the world. They wanted to get silk and spices and porcelain from China and India. They wanted to get tobacco and sugar from the Americas and they wanted to seek out new products of this kind that could be sold at very high rates back at home. So the arrival of the Ndongans in Virginia in 1619 is one of those coincidences of history that just had perfect timing. And after they got here, it changed the nature of the British colonies and led to the system of uh, African enslavement that would come to dominate the British colonies throughout the 18th and America, the United States, into the 19th centuries, all the way up to the, the end of slavery during the Civil War. Now, as I said at the beginning, this is a very complicated topic. This has been a very brief overview of it, but there's a lot more that could be said. So thank you for joining me, and I hope you've learned something new.